Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Full Spectrum Survival Weekly Live Report, where we discuss the important events that are happening in our world, how they affect us within the survival and preparedness communities, and the things that we can do today to start preparing for an unknown tomorrow. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Dunnigan Kaiser from Reluctant Preppers here on YouTube. Now, Dunnigan gets to talk to a lot of people. I've been on, I've been on the Repu Reluctant Prepper show a number of times. He just amasses information from people in the know, people who understand the survival and preparedness genres and the threats that we face as a society. Dunnigan, how are you doing today? Very good. Thanks, Brad. And I appreciate you inviting me on the channel. Oh, well, we're glad to have you. Now, one of the main things that I wanted to discuss with you was sort of the thumb that you've been able to place on the world around us. Now, we see that the first world, the Western world, the East, there are so many things going on right now, so many hot pockets for potential unrest, for world war, uh, economic collapse, everything's out there. From everyone that you've talked to, what would you say the biggest thing that everything keeps coming back to is? One of the themes that has uh, continued to emerge over the past three years that we've been broadcasting on our channel and has certainly been uh, increasing in intensity over the past uh, half a year or so is the fragility of the U.S. dollar. And in the past, it was a lot of the discussion was focused uh, by Jerry Robinson uh, and others on just the uh, and, and Gregory Manorino. And I could just go on and on is the the house of cards that's been uh, set up by the the burgeoning U.S. national debt mm -hmm. and the leveraged uh, uh, derivatives posture that so many uh, of the uh, large brokerage institutions have taken and large uh, mega banks, international banks have taken that are that is just uh, astronomical numbers compared to any real world economic power of uh, gross domestic product or anything of uh, the, the, the real labor output of our planet so that all it would take is another layman moment like we had in 2008. And in this case, the, the, the uh, risks are extremely uh, heightened and the, the situation is much more dire than it was then, that things have not gotten any more stable, more robust and more resilient, but instead the opposite. So that, that was where the discussion was focused over the past, say, two and a half years. But just in the past half year or so, more and more of our guests have talked about the dawning awareness of this has not been lost on the large international players. So you have large uh, central banks, both in Europe and in Asia, as well as uh, major uh, governments, in, in, especially in Asia, and uh, business uh, financial interests in those countries that have been placing their bets, hedging their bets against the U.S. dollar, preparing for the demise of the U.S. dollar. So it isn't, you don't even have to take, you know, some random YouTube prepper people there or even some of the experts that we have on our show who have quite a following um, nationally and, and beyond their word for it. You can look, just follow the money and look and see what the the uh, Saudis are doing, uh, setting up being able to, to, and others being able to sell their oil uh, outside of the U.S. dollar system that had been in place since uh, just after you know World War II, uh, you you've got uh, the, uh, the in the along the the amassing of uh, physical gold being purchased by both uh, China and by uh, India and the the official uh, announced holdings of the government of China being far below what is truly believed to be their actual holdings uh, and also political um, uh, movement and different uh, statements being made and uh, and nonverbal uh, cues being sent by uh, world leaders, especially in the uh, Asian rim, just flexing their muscles economically. And uh, most recently, uh, the event on August 30th of the addition of the Chinese Yuan to the uh, SDR basket of international basket of currencies, uh, really setting up, setting the stage for a decade and more going forward of a shift, a power shift or a critical mass shift away from the dominance of the U.S. dollar as the world reserve currency uh, towards the yuan for one and a shift away from U.S. Uh, global political um, dominance uh, to the emergence of basically a, a comparative vacuum in, in a post uh, 
U.S. Uh, empire and others, David Morgan and others uh, producing the video, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Uh, it's a great, it's a great, easy to watch video. You can look it up on on YouTube. Um, is is really setting the stage for a a tremendous power shift away from the U.S. both politically and economically, and um, that's one of the biggest themes that, that keeps uh, being on the increase. Well, I'll tell you what, that's spot on with what our algorithm sees that as we search for different news events each and every day. For the last five, six years, we've been on a, an upward trend of economic instability. And of course, everyone sees this. We see this in our everyday lives throughout all countries of the world, throughout all the societies. What we're starting to see now, like you said, is a global shift away from the United States. Everyone's jumping ship, so to say. The United States can be thought of as a hard leaning, strict ship's captain for the last 60 years. And now that it's starting to get old, now that the US is starting to lose power, everyone's jumping ship. Look at the Philippines. They're saying, we don't want you anymore. We don't want your people on our land. What we also see is that South Korea and Japan are sort of the last bastions of US dominance around the Asian continent. So we're just seeing a, a migration away from the strong hand of the West into a little bit more of an independence between nations and the rising power of China and Russia. Yeah, and if you look at South Korea and Japan, just to take those two examples that you listed, um, South Korea, uh, where again, we, we fought the, the Korean conflict, again, not called a war, but a conflict. And there was some very interesting comments made by some of our guests about uh, how the United States has gone so far away from uh, calling things what they are and, uh, you know, constitutional uh, separation of powers, uh, power emanating from the people, the, the government being represented to the other people to secure their rights and, and all the constitutionality. Well, you look at that, the power to, to declare war against uh, another country coming only uh, from the Congress by, by the Constitution um, and how, how the U.S., both in the Korean conflict, you know, the Vietnam conflict, the Operation you know, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, all, all of the uh, Persian Gulf activity, anything in Panama, anything. Just keep going down, Libya. Keep going down the list. You won't find that America has been in a declared war uh, since World War II. And uh, some of our guests have commented on how we're we're just so involved in covert actions around the world. It has really, really um, created a lot of animosity against the U.S. Uh, internationally. And it what it does is it takes the power away from the United States people. Uh, where it's supposed to hold the power uh, to actually uh, have say over what our represent our Congress is supposed to be uh, representing us and and uh, and making the right decisions based on our delegated authority to them. Uh, so you look at South Korea under the shadow of North Korea, and uh, that's again where we were, and now uh, with North Korea continually uh, ramping up their rhetoric, uh, doing their repeated. Uh, demonstration of missile tests with that have ranged far beyond Japan, uh, although that you know the Japan Sea has been <laughs> recipient of some of their launches, but those could certainly be arguably uh, or reach the western coast of the U.S. You've also, uh, if you look at Japan itself, you see the country which we were told back in the 1980s was the economic powerhouse of the world, uh, and uh, and the, you know the wave of the future. But they have, and despite being you know, ferocious savers on a on a family level have the worst uh, national uh, debt to GDP ratio of almost any country. Their their economy has been described as you know Walking Dead zombies that that only can be propped up through continual uh, you know purchasing of equities uh, and and negative interest rates and all these crazy um, uh, manipulations to to just keep that uh, from from just imploding. So. Some of our last, as you said, our last bastions of of allies in the Pacific Rim are in dire danger, either uh, politically and and militarily, in the case of South Korea, or economically, in the case of Japan. Yeah, that's right. You know, you spoke of something that was really it really hits home with what we see across the world, and that's the shadow wars of the United States. Just today, we did a piece on uh, Al Shabaab, the Islamic militant group bombing that hotel over in Kenya. 
and uh, their rise in Somalia and how the U.S. on one hand sits here with the rest of the Christian world and the religious spectrum and says this is not a religious war. And then on the other side of the world, everyone knows this is a religious war. And so we have al-Shabaab out front perpetrating crimes, really disastrous crimes against predominantly Christian areas in a predominantly Muslim country. And since the U.S. is at this stance that there's equality here, there's no religious war, now they've engaged in shadow wars in places like Kenya and in Somalia and in the Middle East and all the other places of the world. So you're right, there is a hidden agenda that's taking place here. There's a hidden military agenda that's taking place. And what's at the end of it? It's all about dominance and control. Now, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, echoing on what you're saying about, uh, uh, I, I would stop a little bit short of just characterizing. I think you're absolutely right on about uh, that there are a lot of religiously driven uh, uh, wars that aren't being uh, uh, admitted by people that they're, that that's what's the ideology that's driving them. Uh, the thing that gets missed, certainly the, by the mainstream media, is the, uh, because a lot of people ha have been uh, pretty much brainwashed with very shallow levels of understanding uh, by politically correct uh, ideologies about this and rhetoric about this. Uh, at, people, as, as soon as anybody mentions um, the, uh, the threat to Western civilization of jihad and jihadism, uh, people will immediately speak up and say, well, after all, they've been fighting religious wars forever. Remember the Crusades? And, and, and as soon as you hear the word Crusades, you're supposed to be quiet and, and, and just kind of nod and, and realize, oh, yeah, yeah, people, people of uh, religious persuasions are always are at each other's throats. And that is not a historically accurate uh, picture of the imbalance of, of military uh, um, aggression between right. The Islamic world and the Christian world. If you look century after century after century, what finally, finally, uh, Spain was able to be liberated again, so that it could reclaim its traditional uh, heritage. Uh, but the um, the the genocide, the Armenian genocide, the the Turkish genocide, all these you know preceded the uh, even the Second World War, where we hear about the only. If you ask people where was the Holocaust, where was the genocide, they'll talk about about. Uh, the uh, you know the concentration camps in, in Germany in World War II they don't know that that a lot of those uh, approaches all of those uh, Hitler got a lot of his ideas on how to cause mass destruction against humanity from uh, what had been done before by the Ottoman Turks and so on right and, yeah exactly uh, and even more recently um, that that um, the ideology of radical Islam uh, promotes the it it, it requires it requires its adherence uh, to uh, perform jihad or holy war and the exterminate the near extermination you know when you talk about extinction you can't go to a nature park or anything without get hearing you know if you watch a bird show or a whale show or a dolphin show or anything you're going to hear the speech about the near extinction of all these endangered species right but who how many people know about the near extinction of christians in the middle east for example uh people from the from palestine uh selling they have to come to the u.s to try to sell olive wood sculptures that sort of thing because there's only two percent remaining of the original uh christian inhabitants of palestine and well let's on and on and on let's talk about that for a quick second so here we have syria bashar al-assad who was a western ally and who protected the christians under many circumstances within syria he stopped playing the rules of the United States. Yeah. And he stopped playing by the rules. And so what the U.S. has done and continues to do is to try to remove him forcibly from power by the creation or at the very least the allowance of the rise of power of the Islamic State. That's right. And look at what has happened to Syria. Look at what's going on there. Th these are millions and millions of people who are harmed for geopolitical dominance. That's and, right. And that's the old ahead, saying is it, he, he may be an SOB, but he's our SOB. And that's a lot of our uh, al allies in terms of uh, uh, rulers around the world over the past 50 years and, and probably before uh, weren't because they, they exhibited some kind of, um, uh, you know, moral superiority or anything like that over their over their uh, opponents, but because they were compliant to to cooperate with the U.S. And when that stops, 
then your days your days are up. And there's there's a litany of those who have, anyone who dared uh, risk selling their oil, for example, for any uh, any currency other than the U.S. dollar immediately got replaced. I mean, that happened to Gaddafi in Libya. It's happened to others. Um, so that's right. You, as as a world leader, uh, regardless of how uh, egalitarian you may be to your local people, to whatever, if you lose the favor of the U.S. from political power and economic uh, compliance, then you're going to be on the outs. Yeah, and and look what's happening right next door in Turkey. We had Turkey throw what could be arguably a false coup or the uh, you know the uh, resemblance of a coup, right. and now there's torture being reported during this declaration of emergency in Turkey. There's crimes against humanity. There's black bag kidnappings where the secret police are coming down and taking anyone who is believed to have been a part of this quote unquote uh, coup attempt. So this is right next door to where the U.S. is, is fighting and a United States, predominant United States ally is committing these acts of horror against their people. So I think anybody who can look at even our internal political spectrum right now and say we're we're doing the right thing needs to take a step back and see what happens on the global arena. You know, I had a question come up uh, in one of the comments about the election, and and I find it very difficult to speak about the election, and for the simple reason that the United States will use its political power for corruption and destruction today, and it'll do the same thing the day after the election, no matter who gets into office. And so you'll have a flavor on one side or the other, but the, the role, you know, the ball is going to keep rolling down the field. Yeah. Team red and team blue, but they're playing the same game. Um, and, uh, I just kept back uh, last month from the Ron Paul Institute's Peace and Prosperity Conference in Washington, D.C., which I had the honor to attend. And I got to hear uh, Dr. Paul himself speak, as well as uh, uh, several other congressmen, Tom Bassey and uh, uh, excuse me, Tom Massey and uh, others from the Ron Paul Institute and other guests, um, as well as our, our, uh, Lou Rockwell was one of their mm -hmm. keynote speakers. And, uh, you know, speaker after speaker, there was ex, ex um, uh, special ops uh uh, person there and others who spoke about this principle of uh, U.S. so-called uh, foreign interests or national interests in these uh, other nations' affairs, but uh, really how the, how as you mentioned the the swath of destruction that that has left behind and how it how it drains us financially, it drains the lives of our of our young men and now young women. Uh, to go uh, basically participate in this interventionist foreign policy that is not, that is always uh, as as Ron Paul said it's cloaked in the uh, flag to 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 evoke what should be legitimate patriotic uh, feelings on the part of people it is it is there is nothing wrong with having uh, your own sovereign nation and, and honoring the sovereignty of other nations and, and being proud of your of your homeland and that sort of thing there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, but to to distort and twist and warp that and pervert that and use that as a as a manipulative tool to get the the people of your country, which is what happened to pay with their lifeblood and their life uh, fortunes, to pay for these continuous stream of uh, interventionist foreign policy wars and non declared wars around the world that line the pockets of bankers, line the pockets of arms merchants, line the pockets of uh, politicians who who um you know get involved in in the, these dealings and do not serve uh, the peace and prosperity of the american people or any other people and and leave and leave just horrible uh, uh human life and destruction uh effects you know all around the world so that was a really uh, an eye-opening experience um it it echoed in many ways uh, lessons that i learned from my parents as a youth because both my parents were uh, lifelong uh, pacifists. They were uh, missionaries before I was born, and um, and uh, spent their life, you know, working for non-aggression and for uh, peaceful resolution of conflict, that sort of thing. So that's kind of, you know, I was I was brought up in that, and right. it's and uh, here again to see in today's era uh, these people in Washington uh, who really have had a ringside seat an inside uh, seat in many cases to some of these uh, dirty dealings that we've gotten into it's just saying folks there was another, one of the speakers there talked about the deep state and specifically talked about the um, 
unacknowledged and undocumented sort of the black ops portion of our entire government uh, and all the, the how it gets funded, how it takes action, how it how it uh, is free reign, how it's unaccountable to the Congress, to the Constitution or anything. And it just gives you just a pit in the stomach to finally realize this isn't just crazy talk. These I'm, I'm sitting here among among, <laughs> you know, multiple congressmen and members of the, you know, retired members of the armed forces and everything. And they're saying this is the way it really works. And well, uh, I think that was, I, that was a real rude, rude uh, confirmation of sort of a bias that I had been given from from young age. I think that really hits the nail on the head there in that you brought back a, a, a couple of minutes ago how the people of the United States may may only be experiencing the first hint of suffrage for what is to come because we have now created we've allowed the u.s government to create a consumerist nation that's built only upon war so what are we left with as the usd and as the u.s government loses its power we the people of the united states will hurt and the people of the western world in general that have followed this u.s ideological power trip through the world and and in global dominance, there is very little that we can do to prosper. So this economic shift, this collapse that we are certainly in a in the middle of right now, we're in a phase of the collapse. That's right. Will continue to get larger. The day to day will continue to get worse. The bags at the store will continue to get smaller, while the cost for them continues to get larger. We'll see this happening over and over again. And where will that leave us? And I think that's something that your channel, Reluctant Preppers, does a great justice to the community in that you discuss what each and every person can do on an individual level and sort of a starting small, start anywhere level to begin preparing for those types of events. Now, what would you say, should someone just begin today if they're just listening to all this and they're starting to get that eye-opening experience or maybe they've been in the middle of the aware community for a while but they still haven't taken those plunges yet to remove their reliance off of the state in the event of a disaster or even in the event of just a uh a sh global economic shift should they begin today making those changes there is no other day than today we do not have tomorrow and it's too late to do anything about yesterday. You know, that that's an old saying that, you know, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery. And today is the present. That is the only, today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. Right. And um, that's the only day we have is today. So the answer is an emphatic yes, because that the reason we have reluctant in the title of our, our website, reluctant preppers is because this isn't the way it should be right. This isn't, the way it's supposed to be. We all know that in our hearts that the world isn't isn't supposed to be a place where um, where you're being deceived, where people are cheating you, uh, where you're where uh, you have to you have to like uh, become skeptical, read between the lines, uh, find find the truth behind uh, the message, and um, even from a young age, we're we're raised to believe that uh, that somehow if you just uh, exercise good virtue and and good work ethic and you do the right thing that somehow it's all going to work out in the end and for those with a with a spiritual um bent uh that is the big picture and it is necessary to to exercise good virtue and it is necessary to work hard and and it will all work out in the end but meanwhile there is going to be uh a pain and and you're right we're already in the beginnings of that and that the normalcy bias that we face as a people living in the modern world is hard to overcome it's it's you know a lot of these movies <laughs> whether it's the matrix or others talk about you know the theme keeps coming at us uh through entertainment of sort of this other this reality uh that we can barely perceive because we're so uh we're so hypnotized by you know the things that are that are we're experiencing with our senses and you 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 can't help but realize how true that is so the reluctant part comes from from recognizing that um that is the truth and we do need to make preparations and you mentioned something else about dependent reducing dependency uh again a thing that we were brought up with i guess probably because as children everybody starts out as a child right and you look to your parents uh and the adults in your life as those who are going to provide for you right. and you you believe that somehow um your needs are going to get met and what 
as you learn and grow into adulthood, um, it dawns on you that uh, the world isn't quite the way uh, you thought it might be. And, and there isn't really a fairy godmother who's going to come and, and, you know, turn your pumpkin into a coach. And, and uh, if things get tough, as we saw, you know, go down the list, you know, in New Orleans when the hurricane uh, hit badly or in other places where there's been severe disasters, um, you cannot count on the authorities uh, to be the ones who are going to carry you uh, through, through the next crisis. And the next crisis uh, that most of our guests have been warning us about is going to make the Great Depression, you know, just look like a, a warm-up exercise. Well, and, you know, th that brings up something that's so important, and that's that the rest of the United States relies on the United States government in the event of a disaster, in the event of a localized or regional catastrophe. But that's this right. Everybody is, appeals for, the governor appeals for federal aid. That's, that's the ultimate. That's right. So everyone has this reliance that that aid is going to come. However, this is the same United States, the same government that today with the Saudi-led coalition is bombing the food crops in Yemen, taking the food out of the mouths of the people there, causing a food shortage for political gain. So how could anyone look at that and say, I trust that they're going to come to me in times of need. It's um, worse than it may ever have been, not only in the history of the United States, but perhaps in the history of the world, because so many of the world's population have lost the skills and the knowledge to know how to be independent, how to take care of themselves. If you look in the U.S., back in the Great Depression, there was there was severe weather, dust bowls, all that sort of thing. People had tried to move out west to, to right, get, yeah, where they could grow crops. But they, ninety percent of the of the country, were uh, farmers by by upbringing. They knew how to garden if they had to. They knew how to how to um, raise uh, livestock, that sort of thing. Our modern world has made us so helpless and so. Uh, dependent. We we love the comfort and convenience. It is so easy now just to swing by and pick up supper on your way home from work and you show up and it only took you, you know, three minutes to go to the drive through and you got supper. Uh, you have no idea where that food came from. You and it's, no and it's even worse than that now because it used to be 40 years ago that you knew where that food came from because it was too costly to get it from the other side of the country and not, no less the other side of the world to your table. So you knew local crops and you knew local areas and you kind of at least had sort of a uh, an understanding that food was actually grown not just provided by the supermarket but now it costs more to have local food than it does to have something shipped from across the across the u.s or across the world so how does that not alter the perception of the average person into saying food is just a magic thing that happens. You know, that's kind of the understanding that it just it just happens. And that's why we've had this great shift away from people think it's cruel to cultivate or to husband your own animals and to, yeah. you know, to kill your own animals for food. Right. But yet they're accepting the chicken nuggets that are, you know, just yeah. brought up with antibiotics and left in little cages all their life because they didn't have to see it happen. So there's yeah. this great separation. And like you said, like the matrix, it is a separation of reality and of acceptance of that world around us. And we look, I have a lot of understanding in the psychological side of psychological warfare. And without a doubt, like you brought up, entertainment in apocalyptic and dystopian worlds is a release for people. And that's why it's allowed to continue. Don't ever doubt that if, if a video or a movie came out that the government didn't want you to see because they thought it could incite some sort of action in you, they would not allow it to happen. But they allow these videos to come out because they allow us as human beings, as caring people, to excite ourselves and release that energy. So it just moves past. And so we're, we're stuck back, like you said, just like robots going through the day-to-day -day life, you know. The other thing you mentioned a little while ago about dependence, um, to, I, was, I was kind of on a little bit of a tear there describing why things are so much worse now than they were then. So one, one factor there is, is the loss of the skills and the knowledge and the traditional understanding, the wisdom of most people on how uh, to take care of themselves, how to be independent. Another way that that shows itself is uh, depending how you do your calculation, you can, you can easily calculate that more than half of the country right now receive 
and depend on uh, subsistence from the U.S. government for their daily part of their a majority or a significant portion of their daily income stream, whether it's through pensions, whether it's through uh, entitlement programs, that sort of thing. And uh, if in the event of an economic collapse of the United States, that uh, that necessary uh, stream of sustenance that people have become dependent upon gets withdrawn. Um, it's a, it's a recipe. F it combine that um, with the inability of people to to care for themselves and to and to create, uh, you know, whether it's habitat, shelter, food, et cetera, for their own family. Um, and it's a recipe for a very volatile situation. And, and you're and you're right. It's not just the people of America that have some sort of reliance in one form or another on the government. It's the farmers of America. Look at all of the plans that they have put into place for uh, subsidies and everything to the farmers. I mean, if you peel back that veil of capitalism among the farming and agricultural sectors of the United States, you see a decrepit and rotting future for our ability to produce food at a at a rate and at a cost that is sustainable. So, you know, you're absolutely right. This is, they have done nothing. And they, as a uh, first world governments as a whole, they have done nothing but band-aid after band-aid to sort of keep the cogs moving. And it's, um, it's uh, quite mystifying. If you really think about it in terms of uh, the, the good of the country and the good of its people being to make sure that they can take be taken well taken care of into the future that that we have a basically a resilient plan a a, a plan that's robust for the for the health and wealth and well-being of our people you would absolutely want as part of that plan for people to be able to be self-reliant you'd want them to be able to defend themselves you'd want them to be able to feed themselves you'd want them to be able to take care of each other make sure that they can communicate with each other in the case of emergency right. you'd want all that so what can you point to in our for example public education system that prepares over over the 12 to 13 years full time that, 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 that children are being formed through their upbringing in the public schools. What can you point to in that upbringing that prepares them to defend themselves, to feed themselves, to pr provide shelter and, and, and uh, community and communication with each other? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's not hard without getting too conspiratorial to think there's actually a vested interest here in maintaining dependency and helplessness on the part of the people. No, you're you look absolutely at, You look at a lot of the policies that are being advanced, and you mentioned the upcoming elections and what difference does it make. One, you can say, even though the Team Red and Team Blue share about 80% of their you know, ideologies, if you really back away from it far enough, there is, a, there is some uh, substantial difference between the two bell curves uh, in, in the sense of how, um, how uh, much the, the incentive is clearly a part of a mission on the part of uh, one of those groups a little more than the other to to open the floodgates and, and get more people dependent um, on the government uh, for their for their because the old the old saying is the hand that gives is above the hand that receives right and and it's it's always can be cloaked in oh it's for the good of the people it's for the good of the, of the little people the underprivileged the fridge the mar the fringe the marginalized and everything but if you really look at it uh, it's self-serving in that it reinforces the power of the elite because it, it reinforces their their ability to be in that position of the giver and be ever seen as a necessity rather than as than as a parasite that's really sucking the lifeblood from the people. And as you mentioned before, the unending series of uh, foreign conflicts and foreign wars just uh, keeps that 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 constant sense of uh, uh, alert and need and emergency in the back of the people. So for two reasons, you don't want to get rid of us out of power. A, because you wouldn't want to change horses in the middle of a stream because we're really in the middle of a stream right now. We're in the middle of a big code orange red uh, emergency here. Right. And number two, after all, you wouldn't want to bite the hand that feeds you, right? So it's just both of those are very self-serving on the parts of the, of the people in power. And it's, it's the responsibility of reasonable people, not conspiratorial-minded people, not radical people, it's reasonable uh, people who are who are patriots and who are members who who understand the rights of free men and free women uh, to be to self govern that um, we must take the responsibility to start taking those uh, baby steps at first and learn to walk and learn to really to take care 
of our individual and our family's needs first, and then to reach out and build community. And that's what you do on your uh, channel. That's what we do on our channel is find a way to uh, take those initial steps of basic education, basic learning that we couldn't find anywhere else. Nobody taught us this stuff, um, but we find a way uh, from people who do know how to do it and sort of start even even a little bit each week to uh, learn one new one new thing, one new thing you can do to make a decision that isn't just on autopilot, isn't just participating uh, in a consumer culture, but instead take one small step today to um, be a little bit less dependent and a little bit more independent tomorrow. Yeah, you're you're right, and that's why you know there's been a separation for so many years where survivalists kind of took one road in the social. Uh, social viewpoint of things and then camping and bushcraft and everything and homesteading took a whole nother road and they tried to push so much negativity towards survivalism to make it be like oh you don't want to be a survivalist you don't want you don't want to even think like that you don't want to you don't want to take that thought reliance away from the government so that i do a lot of work there to try and merge those back together because they are one and the same because if you can go camping with your family for a week then you can survive for a week you know and if you can grow some food in half, two liter bottles that you have cut in half, then you can grow food in a disaster. And you start to understand these things. You know, camping sort of provi sort of prepares you for a uh, short to medium duration emergency and bucket gardening and taking care of small animals like rabbits and things prepares you for taking that next step for a long duration emergency where you have to provide your own sustenance. So I think you're absolutely right that you just have to start in learning a new skill. Like if you can't pick a new skill every day, pick a new one every week and say, this week I'm going to do this. And we have a, a large drywall to-do list. And that to-do list is nothing but educational and skill-based things that we're going to work on. So I could go to it any day of the week and look at an electronics project that I want to work on. Um, you know do something with the bug out bags, work on our food storage. You know, there's something there. And so, not all of it is things that I know and just parts of routine. Some things are something that I want to have an interest in or something that I don't know. Because if you had to tell me to fix, uh, you know, a foreign vehicle in an emergency, I would be out of luck. So I, that's a skill point that I need to start building. So you're right, yeah. just start, you know. There's a, <laughs> you made me laugh when you mentioned about fixing a vehicle because a lot of the uh, things that people used to be able to fix on our own have become uh, almost impossible uh, for the average person to be able to fix. And it hasn't just because it's, it's a twofold thing. One is because there really has been a loss of the wisdom and being handed down uh, and how to, how to do things, but it's also the increasing uh, technological advancement of things has taken it out of the realm of of you know the physical what things I can do with my bare hands or with with some simple tools or that sort of thing into the realm of things that only can be handled by a computer or an expert or that sort of thing. So it's the, sort of the expertization uh, of our lives has really made us all feel just basically incompetent in everything that's vitally necessary to our survival, including food, where our water comes from, you know, and on and on, all the all the the repairs and everything. But we can reclaim that even a step at a time. Uh, one of our guests, it's very heartwarming on our channel. We've had uh, both the uh, CEO of Layman's and also the, uh, the uh, uh, vice president of uh, communication for Layman's uh, on our channel. Layman's is a non-electric supplier and uh, they have been for over 60 years uh, providing you know, non-electric solutions at first primarily to the Amish people but uh, now to you know anyone, they've got layman's.com. And, and that's if this is what I'm trying to get to is you mentioned sort of reclaiming how you've done like urban bushcraft and that sort of thing to kind of merge people's lives back together, try to heal that wound um, yeah, right. and, and to undo some of the um, destructive uh, sort of caricaturization that was that was perpetrated on people who are interested in survival. The same thing can be said for all traditional uh, uh, skills as we we've they've been made fun of to the point where uh that it's only cool and you're only with it and you're only going to be popular or whatever have self-respect if you just buy whatever the latest iphone version is or iwatch or whatever that comes out and, and go shop at the mall that's that's, that's it. right that's all yeah. you're permitted yeah. to do if heaven forbid you actually 
make a hobby or a habit of, you know, as we have done, milling, milling your own wheat so you can make your own bread with your kids. Uh, and so they see that that's where that, that, you know, bread actually comes from wheat berries, not from, not from just the grocery or whatever. And on and on and on. If you take on some of those traditional skills, layman's, the reason I'm tying that together is because they are um, very good at bringing home the warmth and the humor and the uh, tradition and the uh, solidness of the, the wisdom of those traditional arts and those traditional skills and making them accessible. You can go there today and you can, you can reconnect with something that your grandmother or your grandfather knew how to do that maybe got lost along the way. So this isn't all just about like picking up uh, very, very strange, very exotic new skills. This is also reconnecting with wisdom that we already know how to do. It's already in our DNA. It's already in our family tree. That's the other way you can look at it. You know, uh, the human, the reason we are having this conversation is we're both here. And that means each of us and everybody listening to this conversation is the product of thousands of generations of successful survival. Survival. That's right. So we, we are members of a family tree, each of us that stretches back thousands and thousands of generations of people who made it, people who made it through tremendous adversity. So this isn't making up something new. It is not taking on something radical. It's reclaiming our heritage. Even if you want to take it back just to the formation of the United States of America, the people who came here and the courage that they had, their willingness to strike out into a new place and to put down their roots and that kind of thing. Um, we are here because um, we come from stock that knew how to how to survive and they knew the wisdom of these arts and we can reclaim that and it's it's it can be comforting it can be a great thing to share with your family and your children we had a guest on recently we've had him on many times joel salatin he's the co-founder of polyface farms in the shenandoah valley and he, he, a recent uh, interview we had with him on how to get your kids and your family to cooperate with you on prepping. So on your preparedness plan, it isn't just something you have to like battle with your family about, oh, oh, dad, quit being such a, such a, a killjoy, talking about disasters all the time. We want to have fun. Can't we just right, you know, right. go to whatever? It actually is, you can make games out of it. You can, you can play all kinds of different ways of gamifying uh, this hobby that you can start for your family and, and reclaim some of that positive family time. So I would suggest if people want to take a listen to the Joel Salatin interviews on, on uh, getting your family to pull together on preparedness and also the layman's interviews, uh, they'll find kind of an unexpected surprise, a very, a very pleasant surprise of a kind of a warm, fuzzy corner that you can start doing preparedness in rather than having it have to be kind of this military bunker is the only way of thinking about it so yeah you know you bring up something important there and that's that sharing these skill sets in an enjoyable way with your family i think that you'll look at any like homesteading channel and you'll see that it's not doom and gloom it's about the sustenance and the ability to do it yourself and if you look at the great bushcraft and camping channels it's not about the world's ending it's about i love getting back into this natural environment and sort of fending for myself for a couple of days or a week or two weeks at a time. So sharing this with your family and with your friends is a very important part of building that community and taking back that, that ugly sheet that they have put on mm -hmm. self-reliance for so many years. But that brings up another point, and that's that when that disaster does strike, who can you trust? And who do you put your trust in? Because undoubtedly, the people that know you or that have heard of you or that you maybe knew a decade ago will remember you in a time of crisis. And we see that happening in Syria. We see it happening in Venezuela. Um, see it happening in, uh, saw it happen in the Balkan Wars in Afghanistan, that people sort of moved back to the people that they knew had these types of skill sets. And they were usually military veterans because that you know, you're taught a certain amount of survival skills in the military. So who do you trust in that sort of disaster? And, and what are your thoughts on how you sort of prepare yourself to turn people away? Have you had any guests talk about that or anything? We have uh, had Jerry Robinson on talking about his dad uh, uh, relating to him that he said that the, one of the most dangerous uh, and frightening things you'll ever meet is a hungry human being. And um, 
that uh, those scenarios of what do you do if there are a gang uh, of individuals, you know, approaching your house with, with an intent, you know, it appears because they've seen them doing it down the block or whatever, you know, uh, ransacking or, or uh, vandalizing or, or, um, or, you know, stealing that kind of right. thing. It gets harder when you turn it to be, what if it's a family in need that's, that's approaching you and, and you see, even on, again, turning back to entertainment, because this seems to be a recurring theme in entertainment recently, it's just almost to a startling degree, this whole thing about po post-apocalyptic worlds. But you see time and again, the setup where someone appears to have collapsed on a road and there's somebody traveling along the road and they, they go to give aid to the person who appears to be in need. And it was just a ambush and they, they yeah, right. turn immediately and all of a sudden anything that they had is no longer theirs. Uh, and those scenarios are uh, sobering to think about and to talk through. Uh, I, I appreciated what you had said on, on uh, interview you had on your channel recently where you talked about the importance of having those conversations with your loved ones and your closest uh friends who are also independence minded right about about what would you do in this kind of situation what would you do in that kind of situation and by hearing i believe firmly uh i i happen to be a storyteller and okay. that's one of my skills and when i i think that we are naturally wired for that as human beings we are automatically drawn to stories if somebody starts telling a, a gripping story we can't not tune in that's just how we're wired as human beings right so so that's a very effective way to share wisdom and to gain it by listening so if you just ask the question if you're struggling in an area like this and i admit i am as well this is a question that by posing it in in the in a uh, a group of, of people that you um, have some like-mindedness with um, and hearing what their thoughts are on that, even even if they're struggling with it or especially if they're struggling with it, the fact that you can hear, hear uh, them kind of talking through a scenario will give you insight uh, that you might not have had otherwise. So the, the importance is, as with anything, is prepared. Uh, when we talk about preparedness, a lot of people think about surrounding themselves with tools and possessions and, and stock store pile, stockpiles and things like that stores. But uh, the preparedness of your mental uh, mindset and having a, a plan of action where you have clear priorities uh, and you've, you've thought it through, you've discussed it, you have um, already made some of those most important decisions will serve you exceptionally well in that situation. Because when uh, difficult uh, stressful situations appear. We we don't always think the clearest. Our our, our thinking brain is not our our frontal cortex is not what's really engaged uh, in a real stressful situation. We kind of go to the reptile brain and we just start uh, tend to fight or flight and that kind of thing. So it's it's much better to have armed yourself ahead of time with a well considered and thought out plan that you can in a moment of calm and reflection, as difficult as it is, to uh, resolve with yourself. I have weighed the moral options here. I've considered it from perspectives. I've looked at, tech, looked at the, the high view, the long view. So I am resolved without a doubt in my mind, if this has happened, this is how I would deal with it. I think realistically as humans, even if we prepare ourselves in that way, it's still going to be the hardest thing we've ever had to do. Um, I, I tremble at the thought of, of a lot of those situations, but um, I think well, you're right because the thing to do is to talk it through look at today's world where if somebody if a family member came to you in need it would most likely be financial need or if they had a question about say you know this uh, i have this ailment and you would be able to give them sort of first world advice and if it was financial need you'd be able to say no i can't do it and you wouldn't fear that you gave them their death sentence by not giving them financial aid however in a medium or a long duration emergency you're right. You will have that clear understanding that you may be anyone you turn away, you may be giving that death sentence to, and you are putting them back on their own path and not allowing them to rely on you. And that's a hard thing to do. And like you said, in our current world, we're able to look at everything and we're able to make good decisions on sound thoughts and we're able to sort of pick everything apart. But in a disaster, even in a short term disaster, our thinking gets very narrow and it becomes more of, is this immediate action gonna hurt me or, or is it gonna help me survive? Mm -hmm. So as our thinking gets more narrow, you're more likely to make incorrect decisions 
with a stressed mind. So having that game plan in place now, and not just you, but your significant other or your children or your parents, sort of having that understanding and talking it out now, everyone will revert back to that thinking rather than making a, an emotional split second decision. And like you brought up, sort of discussing these things with people in the current realm of the world allows you to gauge their general understanding of the world around them. So many times has it happened where I have brought up those sort of leader conversations of what would you do in this scenario and heard the things that you don't want to hear. Like, oh, I would just go, yeah. go get this from that person or I've got the guns, I would just go kill them. That, that's the sort of thing where, that you want to know now before that person comes to your door and puts a smile on their face and says, hi, Johnny, can I, you know, can I stay with <laughs> you during the crisis? Because that person will turn on you. Or looking at it the other way, if members of your closer group, whether it's your family or your closest friends, say, well, I would just give them whatever they needed, uh, you realize you have to be careful about who you choose to invest you know, your resources with, that kind of thing too, because um, there, you're not obliged uh, morally to just give everything away. You don't, when you talked about <clears throat> you turn, potentially turning someone away, being their death sentence, in the one sense, um, from a moral standpoint, um, there's a huge difference. It makes all the difference if you say, I am faced with a choice and I am fully aware that if I make this choice, it has a predictable and foreseeable outcome that harm could come to another. But that is not my desire. Right. That is not my intention. That is not what I choose to um, essentially uh, cause to happen for them. But I, I can choose not to uh, prevent it. If it is, if by doing that, what I'm really choosing is I'm choosing to take care of protect, you know, my own self preservation, uh, my family, that kind of thing. So you do have the right to, uh, take care of your, yourself and your family and not basically, um, uh, you know, undermine your own, um, survival just out of this idea that you're just obliged to just give everything away. And that, and that can be true for uh, countries as well. If you look at yeah. you, you, every cell of our bodies knows it has that wisdom built into it. There's a thing called a cell wall around, around there's a membrane around it. it's a semi permeable membrane. It's not everything can come in and go through a wall. If you go and look at what happens during uh, most virulent cancer uh, uh, in episodes in, in a body there's this rupturing of the cell walls of whether it's viruses do that as well but cancers do that and they, they cause this breakdown of the integrity of the individual cells and as soon as enough of those cells are broken down the entire organism fails you look at an entire uh, family it can be the same things does your family have healthy boundaries you know as a person do you have healthy boundaries in relationship with others and then beyond the family um uh you, the nation itself do you are do we have you know Borders are there to to uh, be part of the, the integrity of the organism that is the nation, the sovereign right. state. So at every level, um, uh, there's there's a valid moral case to be made for upholding the 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 the, the valid uh, boundaries that make us that define and separate you know individuals or countries that sort of thing. Now, at the same time, you the more as people with a big heart want to do all they can to help others. That is wonderful. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. So another way to spin that is when people are on the fence of saying, should I start getting prepared? Look at it this way. The earlier you start getting prepared and the more you prepare and the more diversely and the more you network out with others and so on, the more you will be able to help others in the event of, you know, of a disaster. A, right. Yeah, a disaster. So. Yeah, well, Kanzi in the chat room brought up a great point. That's that if you turn others away, you'll be inviting a problem and they might turn back with a bigger desperate group. And that's where, and he even brought up the solution there, you remain, you retain a certain amount of personal secrecy and operational security. And no one knows exactly what you have. They just know that you have skills. So no one has to know that you're prepared with a month or two months or longer of food rationing. No one has to know that you have, uh, you know, more than one firearm. No one has to know these things. Don't share that with people who you wouldn't trust your life with. But if someone comes to your door, because they will come knowing that you have skills or that you have considered a survival lifestyle or that you go camp, even if you just go camping a lot, 
during a disaster, they're going to come to you for help because their whole world just fell apart. Mm -hmm. But turning them away, if they don't know that you have anything beyond that door and saying, I'm sorry, I'm barely keeping it together. I think we're going to have to leave ourselves. They're not going to come back. There's no reason to. There's plenty of, you know, other things if they want to be nefarious there's plenty of other things for them to move on why would they come back knowing you have a gun and no preparedness and there's there's even an, a, another path there that may be a hybrid of these and that is um sharing even with people in those desperate times sharing a skill sharing uh, a tip sharing um some way that you can actually help them um, because it isn't like it's just a zero sum game. It isn't just there's only so much stockpile and I if I give you any mind then I won't have it, that kind of thing. There's right. also, hey, did you know that there's some uh, there's some firewood available down there near the river or there's you know whatever uh, giving people tips some and as you, you mentioned this on your channel too, but we've had uh, people that we've talked with as well who've talked about having a bin full of you know, uh, hoodies that you bought when they were on clearance at the off season sale or whatever and being able to say, listen, I don't have, a lot of you know that I can that I can share, but I do have some some extra uh, sweatshirts with hoods on them if it'll help keep your kids warm. You know, yeah, or a dollar thing. store poncho, a couple of yeah. dollar store ponchos, yeah. and an emergency you blanket. Yeah, you know. if you can, if you can hand them something that you know truly uh, shares uh, the expression of your goodwill towards them, you and you, you can give them a tip of information or anything like that. And uh, but you don't. I agree with you completely. It's it's. Uh, it's not people's nature necessarily, but it is important to, uh, when you're looking after the needs of your family, to maintain um, uh, propriety and, and privacy around that in all along the way. So that that's a real. Um, we have we've had privacy experts on our channel. In fact, the editor of the Privacy Journal, which is the oldest uh, running uh, journal on the topic of privacy in the United States, has been on our channel multiple times. You can see his mm-hmm. his work, and um, he talks about the this, the right that you have to protect your privacy and some ways that you can do that. Um, so that that is very important as well. Yeah, that's a great. That brings up a couple of great points, actually. Um, one of the last things I know we're running up on our end of time here. One of the last things that I want to talk about is. A couple of people have mentioned in the chat about being the gray man. And while I don't follow, I don't feel that you have to follow that 100% and you don't have to take it on as this new being tactical, you know, not tactical, but looking cool and not, you know, I'm going to know if they're, if you're carrying a firearm, unless you've done a very good job at concealing it. And I'm going to know that those are tactical pants, not just, you know, uh, Walmart mm-hmm. pants made out of the same materials. I'm going to get that feel from you. So understanding that and knowing not, you have to kind of walk that thin line of don't carry your army issue bag and don't be wearing your army pants and boots while walking down the street, but at the same time, still be prepared. You know, that is a thin line that each individual kind of has to walk for themselves. What are your thoughts or what have your guest thoughts been on that? Well, one of the things you just made me think of when you said that was um, then the some of our guests have talked about just because you have, um, in fact, that was one of our most recent uh, guests um, uh, uh, from, he's actually a NASA scientist. He was on earlier talking about EMPs and that sort of thing, but he came back to talk about optimizing your survival plan. And one of the things that he said, this is Dr. Arthur uh, T. Bradley, and he talked about uh, that you want to, uh, just because you have a skill doesn't mean and our tool, you know, just because you have a weapon, just because you know how to, to do uh, our martial arts, just because you whatever, or you have a stockpile of food, you don't bring that out first thing. You do everything you can to avoid even having to use it. That it's much more prudent to get out of the way of a situation. If, if you really think about it, your goal of having a gun is not to use a gun. Your That's goal right. of having a gun is so that in the in the worst case scenario, if you absolutely had no other options, you would have that option. But, right. And it can increase some of your confidence, that sort of thing. But, you know, the goal of being a black belt in karate is not so you can beat people up. It's it's uh, it's to keep yourself safe. And if you really are interested in safety, then you put that as your first priority and not using the tool or using the skill or using the technique or using the the, the asset that you have. So so like you're saying, you don't want to flaunt it you want to uh, cultivate it, but find a more uh, graceful ways to avoid uh, situations. And that's really what's going to help you keep your family uh, safe a lot with a lot less risk of your, of your uh, life, livelihood, capital, that sort of thing. 
and that's kind of one of the the biggest takeaways is we are a society built on consumerism and there are certain companies and certain outreaches out there that facilitate that consumerism in the survival and preparedness genres and all, there's very few things that a human needs to survive and like you talked about Dunnigan was we come from a stock of survivalists we come from a stock of survivals who have went through so much turmoil so much disaster they've went through plagues and sickness and uh, depravity and so many other things and food shortages but yet we stand here today not because we had shiny tools but because we are strong as individuals so there are so many things out there that you can buy but having the skill no one can take that away from you so knowing how to start a fire knowing uh you know some general escape and evasion techniques will save you from having to use your gun if you know how to evade um you know being located or being captured it'll save you from having to seek help from someone else if you can make your own fire so just get those skills in place and start building them and you brought that up maybe 20 minutes ago 30 minutes ago was start today build a skill take a skill that you don't know and just start looking for how to find it you know Yep, and uh, if people come back to our channel, uh, reluctantpreppers.com, over the next week, we're going to have a new guest on from a outfit called Sealed Mindset. They, uh, it's a founded by a U.S. Navy SEAL who was medically retired from the SEALs because of uh, injuries, uh, but it was to continue to train people how to protect themselves and their families and thereby protect the USA. And and one of his uh, uh, main points that he makes is this multi-step uh thought process and a plan that you make ahead of time on how you can do many things to avoid a dangerous situation, evade a dangerous situation, you know, uh, size up and, and find a way to mitigate a dangerous situation, on and on and on. And that the idea of having to actually engage in a fight is by far one of the most risky and costly uh, options you could take. So that is you want to be your last option. So right. it gives you like this eight step program to avoid having to do that, but then you're fully prepared if you have to. So That's right. it gets back to the theme that you're saying is there's so much more uh, wisdom in finding ways to survive um, through some of these ways of avoiding direct uh, flaunting. Conflict, uh, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so well done again. Thank you so much for being here with us. You brought a wealth of information to our channel today and to the entire community. I want to urge everybody to go to Dunnigan's YouTube channel at Reluctant Preppers. If you go to reluctantpreppers.com, he's redoing his website, so you'll start you'll see it start to pick back up. Right now it shifts you over to the YouTube channel. So if you go to reluctantpreppers.com today, bookmark it and use that to get to his channel. As soon as the site's back up, you're going to see it online there. Dunnigan, thank you so much for being here with us. Absolutely, Brad. Thank you for all you do with your full spectrum survival daily, daily news briefs and your in-depth uh, topics and your weekly uh, guests as well. So it's just it's a great service, helping us to connect with each other and learn those basic skills. So just thank keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much, and thank you, Rain and We, and everybody who's in the chat, everybody who answered questions that we weren't able to get to. There was a great discussion going on uh, about rabbits and animal husbandry and what you should store and store in water and how to filter and the best filter there's so many things that we didn't even get to touch on but the community is so great that they help each other out so thank you everybody for being there and if you question that we didn't make it to or if you're watching this later leave it in the comments we answer each and every comment um, or send me an email at fullspectrumsurvival at gmail.com and don't forget to go and subscribe to done again so thank you everybody and stay safe and keep watch take care all